we'll just go ahead and dive right in so we have time for um, any questions that you may have. At the Collaborative, we had the pleasure of meeting Amy Crowell with Next Stage Advisors about a year ago um, at the begin beginning of 2020. And her company is um, meets such a great niche that a lot of nonprofits have, I think, when they're really ready to just jump expand, but are not yet ready to hire a full-time development person. So that's where Next Stage Advisors uh, serve such a critical role. Amy has been a true for the collaborative and to many nonprofits throughout the area. And um, I know she will bring a wealth of information um, to us this afternoon. So she has already started screen sharing. And so I'm just gonna turn it over to Amy and let her take it from here, okay? Awesome. Well, hey everybody, um, I'm happy to be here today and um, just know that this should be a fun and interactive. So, you know, feel free to throw out questions and um, I'm gonna just jump right in since um, I was behind, um, but I, I'd be interested um, and maybe I'm having a little trouble with seeing the chat, but um, I think, you know, there's still, unfortunately, a little bit of a use for virtual fundraisers. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that and the different types, but I'm also gonna share a little bit about what I'm seeing in um, the market right now, as far as like, what people are doing um, about being virtual or hybrid or a little bit of both. Um, so we'll talk a couple minutes about virtual events, um, the different types, how to market them, some execution tips, um, and then some resources, and then we'll try to go through any questions that there might be. Um, so by now everybody knows a virtual fundraiser is going to be something that's going to be online in some way, but still a paid experience, although you know certainly some people are doing them for free in hopes that they get a bigger donation down the road. Um, I've seen that go be successful in both ways, to be honest. Um, but it, it also just keeps everybody engaged. If you always have an annual gala and you ha haven't had it and people don't hear from you for a year or more, then you know they kind of start to forget about you a little bit. So it's a good way to you know, remind people that you're there and hopefully raise some money along the way. Um, and I, I do think in-person events are gonna be back. Um, you know, I don't know if it's gonna be this year in the fall or next year, but um, I don't think we're gonna give away uh, our in-person events in favor of staying virtual, although I suspect in some ways some of the virtual will stay um, because I think there have been some good parts to it. Um, so these events are going to be uh, aggressive outreach supported by compelling online content. So, um, you know, at the end of the day, it's still a fundraising campaign. I think sometimes it almost starts to we get a little closer to a peer-to-peer -peer fundraising in that you're hoping to get the people you've always had, but that's also the thing you consider inviting friends or others to join you as well. Um, and then I think you want it to be as professionally produced as possible. Um, most of what I'm seeing is people try to do as much pre-recorded content in these things as possible, although I really believe having some live, especially around any kind of fun and need, is important because um, I think it's a hundred percent pre-recorded. If people sometimes people can tell, sometimes they can't. But I think if you're going to do some real fundraising in there, um, having that live component definitely helps. Um, Amy, yes. I, um, I'm sorry to I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I'm still seeing the first slide, and I'm not sure if you have advanced. It sounds like maybe you're on slide three. Yeah, sorry. Okay. Um, That's okay. Let me try this. That I've just, that might help.
any better? Sorry. That's okay. I'm still seeing the same thing. I don't know if it's just me. Let me try to stop sharing. Okay. Is that better? Oh, oh, much better. Does it move now? Yes. Is it moving now? Okay, awesome. Yes. Okay, so sorry. Um, okay, so I think what we are finding is that these virtual events often don't make the same amount of money, but they also don't cost as much to do you really could end up in the same, um, you know, relative place as far as fundraising goes. Um, you're still gonna need your staff, you're still gonna need your volunteers, um, and you may wanna use some of the normal technology that you normally use. So if you've always used a certain website to, you know, sell tickets or take donations, like just because we're redoing this in a new way doesn't mean you have to throw out everything you've ever done. Um, so important things to think about, like any event, you want to focus on your brand and your mission. You want to show what you do and its impact. So, you know, it's still a great place to include your stories, your testimonials, you know, things that are really showing what's happening in your organization and, and why they give, why you should give, why it matters. Um, and then think about what your events typically are and see what you can capture. Um, you know, I have a client that's doing some, um, events soon and they had a big food and wine event typically so what they're doing is basically these um still beer and wine events and either you get a package with the beer and the you know the wine and there's a leader that's going to take you through the tastings and so it still mimics some of what people really enjoyed and liked about the event um so uh move in here okay okay so types of virtual events, um, and maybe people can put this in the chat um, if, what, if, is anybody doing virtual events now? And are there ones that, or maybe they've done them already that they've had some success and I'm happy to talk about that too. Um, but I think people are, you know, what I'm seeing most often is uh, the, the gala. Um, and then the, that one, of course, um, has been popular, as well as um, people are still doing golf tournaments, and they can do that in person or um, random black boxes over the slide. Hmm. Not sure why that is. Anybody? Is that better? And they they move around, Amy. So I don't know okay. if it's your clicking that, or, or what. There? Luckily on, yeah. Luckily on this, we can still see all of the text. Better, but all right. Um, that's um, better. So the virtual still 5K. one block. Um, what I am seeing with the five Ks is is the hybrid. So there's still people who don't want to be out and about in a group running. Um, but then there's also people who are doing them and they're just keeping them very um, tightly from a quantity of, of people participating perspective. Um, locally, there's some great running um, and race producers that are doing a really good job with those. Um, so you could certainly, if you're comfortable at this point, do a hybrid where you may have, you know, maybe your event usually has a thousand people, but you're going to do 500 in person, you know, time so that everybody's spread out. Um, and then you, but you can also have the virtual runner. So if somebody just wants to support your organization and go out and run or walk their own route, they can do that as well. Um, so for that, you wanna set a goal. How many runners 
definitely you want to tap into your local expertise as far as promoting the event. So you have maybe have a runner in store that would be a sponsor. Um, maybe there's announcers or guest speakers. I think you want to find ways to get your participants connected if you are if they're doing the a virtual event. So it could be you know you take a selfie with your picture and a hashtag at mile one. You connect with a friend at mile two. You can do playlists, you can do swag so they can either pick it up ahead of time or mail so they can wear their shirts or whatever. Um, and for that, when you really want to use the same forms you've already been using for your donations and your websites, because there's no sense in, in recreating the wheel from that perspective. Um, ways that you can kind of up that is by um, creating a VIP package where maybe you get a little more swag, you get a little more extras, um, and then it costs something a little bit more and that helps with your fundraising. Um, you can keep and sell your same sponsor packages. You can, um, you can certainly promote walking with friends and, and you know, trying to get it to be a little bit more peer to peer and group. So maybe you're not comfortable going out with 500 other runners, but you and your friend have been walking anyway. Um, and I think anything you can do to kind of create that camaraderie or get people together um, even, you know, having like, that connection, it just makes them much more likely to want to be part of it. Um, and then, you know, you can add, do take that to a peer to peer campaign where you ask them each to maybe, you know, support them by making a donation to their organize to your organization. Okay, so virtual golf tournaments is another one. I am seeing people doing in-person golf tournaments. I think especially where there's some pretty inexpensive or even free software that takes care of registration and those kind of things. So you don't end up with a big group of people at the table at the same time. Um, definitely am seeing that. But also um, I'm seeing people say, okay, we're all gonna golf and, but we're gonna golf in our own hometowns and we're gonna, golf with our friends that we already are doing things with in our, in our bubbles. Um, and, and then, you know, still do the fundraiser, still make it a group effort. Um, so that, and, and I think the golf courses have been very accommodating with that because, you know, they're not as busy as they were. And again, I think as things open up and more and more people get vaccinated, then all these things start to get back to normal. But in the meantime, this is a great one um, that you can still probably do safely in person if you're comfortable and at least find some people who, who will attend. Um, some of the good things about having it virtual is that you can have it over multiple days. So it's not, you know, if it's on Friday XYZ day and you already have something going on that day, you can't attend. This gives you a little bit more flexibility. It also gives you flexibility that you can be in different parts of the country if your organization has a national footprint. Um, there is great technology and I'll go into some of the companies later that can do all the online ticketing and registration, show the sponsors, keep track of the score, do all those great things. Um, and of course you can do some fun swag, either picked up there to, at the course or sent ahead of time. Um, and then looking to ask for donations before and after as well to support the, the organization. Sponsors may still be in play with that. I think there are organizations that still wanna sponsor and there's not the events out there that they typically would be able to. So that'll give them a little more as well. Um, the gala. So, is anybody um, has anybody done a gala? Let's see if there's anybody um, in the chat. I'm seeing a lot of galas. Early on, the galas were great and easy because you kind of already done um, some of the sponsor sales and things of that nature. Um, as it, as the year went on and it, maybe some of the pre work hadn't been done, it got a little bit harder. But I still have seen a lot of really successful galas. Um, it has the same basic components that it always had. Um, and, you know, as far as it, fund, fundraising goes, you can do virtual tables with little breakout rooms. Zoom is actually pretty good about letting you have little breakout rooms so that you can still see what's going on, but also still have people in there. Um, and you're still looking at the same ways of raising money, whether it be from sponsors, ticket sales, auctions, paddle raises, that kind of thing. Um, these are what I've seen as the most successful components of that virtual gala. Um, having a mission-centric message at the beginning, 
a video is fine. If you have somebody who's great on camera and can do it without the video, that's fine too. Um, but we found the video is helpful. Um, a board chair or executive director message. Um, you wanna give people time to kind of respond in chat box. I definitely would recommend having a staff member or a volunteer, their job is to interact on that chat box. I've seen some great back and forth, people you know, kind of get them going like, hey, where's everybody from tonight? Get everything going, make comments. It's, it becomes a little less like you're just watching TV and a little more interactive. Um, you can do a tribute to an honoree if that's part of your normal um, program. Um, and then you want to do some time specific events and kind of keep everybody posted. So if you're going to do an auction or a paddle raise or a raffle pull or something like that, um, that can all be in there as well. Um, live entertainment is fun. Um, I actually had one event that I was involved with where um, this, this organization um, benefited children. So they had a, a teenager create like a whole playlist um, kind of DJ style. And so that was at the beginning while kind of you're waiting to get that critical mass of people logged on. Um, so you can definitely do things like that. And what we found with that event was we actually could really have used, um, and we've done this going forward, um, to use, have that same idea, but have it be after two, because people kind of want to linger. It's like the party doesn't just end, just like how when you have a live event, there's always those people you're kicking out when the lights go on. <laughs> um, so chat rooms are great. Um, and then you want to have some kind of thank you at the end, obviously. Ideally, if you're going to do um, some kind of paddle raise, you know, you can kind of show the amount raised or a thermometer as well. Um, those kind of things are good to show continued progress in the fundraising side of things. Um, so it, a lot of these sites will have kind of a web page as the home base for this, even though you're going to show the program on a Zoom or a hop in or something of that nature. Um, so what I have seen most successfully is to sort of have this one home page. And it has all these different buttons of places you can go. So you've got your main ballroom where you're going to have your main programming happening. Um, there's another link for the sponsors. There's some stories or mission stories or testimonials. Um, if you're going to sell two levels of tickets, you can do the VIP area. Um, and maybe, you know, again, maybe that's a supreme um, event um, ticket where they got a bottle of wine ahead of time and there's a little wine tasting or maybe there's time with the executive director or another special guest. Um, you can even do photo booth type stuff so you can link to, to social media and get a little bit more interactive and um, social media that way engagement as well. Um, so those are the three main things, the 5K, the gala and the golf tournament. There are other things I've seen that are fun too. So, you know, maybe again, it's like a coffee fireside chat with a VIP. Um, I've seen people do virtual spas. I've seen the virtual auction and the raffle. So there's definitely different ways to engage. Um, I think when you're doing those, like they need to make sense. I think now that people are going out a little bit more, you know, the idea of doing the yoga class at your house may or may not be as appealing as it was when you couldn't leave your house. <laughs> um, so you just have to kind of decide what, 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 what you think is there. And also like what your audience is going to be interested in. If, you know, if something ties really well into your mission of, you know, we're going to do a meditation session because it's mental health awareness month. And this is what, you know, ties together, then that makes sense and just make it, make it make sense and make it be organic. Um, so do you guys have any questions so far? I'll pop the chat. I think the chat was what was causing my those black square. So just to make sure um, anybody has any questions. What for a beginner, what's the easiest option to start with? Um, I think golf tournaments are probably the easiest of those live events if you're gonna do live. Um, if you're going to do virtual, um, probably the 5k because, you know, people are kind of going on their own and it's just a matter of getting people to, uh, to do it. But if you want to do in-person or hybrid golf tournaments, I think are the easiest live fundraising events anyway, the, 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 the golf course does a lot of the work. Um, but for 5k's, uh, I think if you're going to do all virtual, the 5k would be easier. And, um, let's see, I think there's one more chat question. 
Um, easiest live. Um, easiest live is interesting. Amy, um, I think again, it depends on your audience. I, I will tell people this all the time, like fundraising events, especially the gala is it's a hard way to raise money. I think it is a very important way because it brings in new donors and new people that are interested in your work. But um, yeah, I think live, live, easiest live would be the golf tournament. Um, 5k next, the gala has just a lot of components. Um, so, you know, if it's a first time gala and you have the budget, sometimes it helps to have somebody to help you with that, whether it be an event planner or someone more on the fundraising side, because it's just a lot of pieces. And what I have found um, is that when you do a gala, it is really easy to just get so tied up in the logistics of the event that you're not fundraising in the way that you probably want to be. Um, so some marketing ideas um, for these events. So you want to be marketing hey. in the same way you always have. Um, but I think, you know, with the virtual world, there's some other things. Um, sorry. So ticket sales, um, you know, whether it's ticket sales or runners or whatever it is, you know, that individual person buying to participate. Um, I still think a printed save the date is not a bad thing because um, it gets in your mailbox. As we all know, we get so many emails, so many things to be involved that that printed piece of paper can be very helpful. Um, you want your event committee, hopefully you still have that committee, you know, the same group of people that would have organized your in-person event, or if it's a new event, you create that committee. Um, your board of directors, you can require them to sell, you know, require, you have to see what they'll do. Um, but try to keep them to do to, you know, everybody who's going to sell 20 tickets or whatever it is. Um, you can also do, and I think I've had this on another slide, but you can do like an ambassador program where for everybody who sells 10 tickets, they get a free ticket, something of that nature. Or you can have like table captains or people that, you know, commit to really getting their friends and influencers there. Um, if it's a gala, you may think about having a host committee, which is typically, you know, a group of people who are, you know, influential and have friends that they're comfortable inviting. And I think what I've seen with those is typically there's a set of people and they're comfortable inviting their friends to things. And then when it's their friends have things, they go to them and it kind of becomes this uh, relational type thing. Um, you can do a discount for early bird. I, I see that a lot. Um, and it just, especially for a run where, or a walk where weather starts to be a component, if you're, if you're doing a live event, to, it's nice to say, okay, commit today and you'll save $10 or whatever. Cause that way, if you wake up and it's a rainy day, you still have that committed amount of people. Um, and then social media, I definitely, I, I think social media is a great thing. If you have some influencers that have big lists and those are great, but what I would recommend is you go ahead and write them pictures, whatever you want them to look like so that all they have to do is copy and paste and not have to put a lot of thought into it. If they want to put thought in it, they can, but if not, it's just pretty, pretty easy to go. Um, there's Google ad grants. Facebook ads are very reasonably priced um, and can be very targeted from a regional perspective. So again, going back to that 5k, Facebook ads are great. You can boost that post and it really goes, you can say, I want it to go to people who have clicked they're interested in walking and running. Um, lists on local websites. So if you have a patch in your neighborhood or that kind of thing, um, you know, neighborhood associations, things of that nature, that's all great. Um, also, again, if you're going to partner with you know, if it's a 5K and you're in a park or the running store, see if they can get that in there. Um, I, I think put phone calls to past attendees, especially if it's a gala and it's a little bit more expensive um, and text and emails, anything personal, um, you know, you can send out that mass email, but the reality is if somebody sends me dear Amy and it's somebody I know, I'm much more likely to read it. It takes more time, but then, you know, maybe you have a volunteer that logs into your email and, and does it for you. They can be cut and paste, but I think the more often that they're, the, the more personalized they can be, the more effective they're going to be. Um, you definitely want to make that purchase easy. So that's why I have some different software I recommend to use. Um, but if somebody has to go through eight screens to buy your ticket, they're probably not going to. So keeping it, you know, as streamlined as possible is, is super important. You, you know, you'll be able to see where people drop off. Um, and the more they have to go through that, the worst. Um, and then just kind of to think about your list. So, you know, somebody asks, I think, you know, what's the first, what's the best 
thing to start with. You know, if you have a pretty responsive list, you're still going to look at 10% is going to do something. So, you know, if you call 10 people, three people will show some interest and one person will actually do it. So if you're wanting an event with 500 people, then you need to have 5,000 pretty responsive names and, you know, not a cold list, but, um, and you may be lucky and it may be much better, but, you know, I think realistically that's about what we see. Um, so sponsorships are a little harder to recognize in a virtual world. You know, it does, you're not going to have the table of 10 for free, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so some of the, some of the ways that I've seen the sponsors to get a little more love um, for their commitments are, you know, more social media, more emails. If you're doing an app, um, which is especially good if you're doing galas, because you may have like an auction and if people will be on their phones making bids and things, you can definitely do logos there. Um, there can be website banners on those main pages or those emails that go out about the event, um, giving them the opportunity to thank from the, like uh, if you're doing a gala or some sort of a, a event where you can do some pre-recorded thank you so they get that extra, um, I would save that for your top people. Um, of course, you're going to have the screens that have all the logos, just like the back of a race t-shirt or something like that. Um, and then you can also let them, if there's going to be some kind of a swag bag, maybe put something in that. As far as who to sponsor, you definitely want to go back to your past sponsors um, first. Um, and hopefully they'll, you know, they'll renew, they'll see that your need is probably higher and maybe your fundraising was down from last year and they're going to be responsive to that. Um, but you also want to look at your board and committee member owned companies, companies um, that your organization or your board or committee members spend money at. I always tell clients like run your accounts payable or your, your, uh, your pay, your expenses. And who are your 10 top 10 people that you are spending money with? Go to them and see if they'll be a sponsor for you. Um, a, a lot of times they will. Um, and then of course, companies that are still doing well. Um, you know, I, I have, been reluctant to ask restaurants to give gift cards this this day and age, but on the other hand, grocery stores are probably okay. You know, so that, that if you're going to do some some auction items, just I think try to be cognizant of what's going on and you know the favors that you ask if they make sense. Um, also, companies that care about your cause and or want to engage your constituents. So again, if you're doing a 5K, the running store makes sense. Um, and then if it is a local event, companies that are close. So, you know, if everybody's going to come to one place to do that run, those companies nearby are really good leads as well. All right. I'm going to check in on the chat real quick while this is changing. Uh, Amy, it was a little further up, yeah. um, so I want to okay, be great. sure. Um, um, Okay, so planning. Your timelines are gonna be very similar to your live events. Uh, if you're gonna do swag, um, you just need to keep that in mind. Like if, if you're not going to pick up your t-shirt at a race store, then you may need to you know, push things out a week to get mail. Um, and then definitely more time on the tech because on a live event, you may have a run through, you might have some one-on-one -on -one conversations with people to talk about their speaking points and things like that. Um, but you're going to want to do all that plus probably more, maybe even more than one run through if you're doing live video. And if you're doing um, pre recorded, then there's that side of it as well that has to be on there. Definitely, if you're doing uh, any kind of event that's on Zoom or something similar, you're going to want, in the same way that you want somebody running your chat, you're also going to want somebody on tech because there's always somebody who can't get on or whatever. I think it's getting easier, um, but you want, you don't want your executive director worrying about the tech side. You want somebody else to manage all that. Okay, um, definitely some testing and retesting of technology. And that's where the pre-recorded comes in handy because the more that's done ahead of time and can be pieced together, the less transitions. Those transitions to the live and back and forth. Usually there is a delay period, but then there's just, you know, there's room for those things to go wrong. Um, yeah, and we did talk about that other part. Um, you want to test your internet connection for your speakers. We had one event where, you know, she was just glitchy. It wasn't her fault. She's in this apartment in New York and it just 
it was, it ended up okay, but at the beginning, so definitely more, you know, and ideally you would test it at that same time of day at that night of day or night of the week, because, you know, if every child is online at one o'clock in the afternoon doing virtual school, especially during the height of things, it looks different than Saturday night at six o'clock. Um, good quality headsets are important. You wanna look at the camera uh, and you can kind of practice that if you're really looking at the camera, not at your screen. Um, and you wanna have a nice simple background. There's these ring lights that people send. You may even send them. Uh, if you want things to look a certain way, you could send them a green screen and a ring light and then you could put on your own background so that everybody looks the same and you kind of feel more like you're all in the same room. Um, I think most people don't do that. I think we all get like, we're not all together right now. So, um, but that's some different things you can do. And making sure you're not backlit is another one. Um, so these are some of the um, places that I've gathered as far as um, where and how to host your events. Um, for the running event, you can see my little icon. So active is also a marketing tool. So you can register through that site but you can also market. Um, and there is additional cost for that, but it may be something that you wanna do. Um, the golfstatus.org is another great site for the golfers. Um, and uh, you can use that to really manage the whole process, especially if you're doing it virtual and people are all over the place. It gives you really great opportunity to keep score and also give your sponsors the extra attention that they want. Um, and then for the gala, there's a lot of different ways to do gala. Um, and what I am seeing more and more is people going back to Zoom because I think people know how to get on it and it's been popular. You can do the breakout rooms, um, but, and then you can also do it in combination with like an auction sponsor, a, a auction sponsor like the Give Smart or the One Cause. Um, Qtega is another one that I have, have used. Um, and I don't have that one up there, but it's Q-T-E-G-O. I've actually been pretty happy with that one. If you're doing um, a gala type of event, that one's great because the donating part is absolutely as easy as you can. When you register to get that link to go on, you can enter your credit card at that number and literally you push one button and you've made a donation. Um, so in the realm of keeping it simple, um, you just do a little work up front, but then that night, if you want to push a hundred dollars or a thousand dollars, it's almost to the point where you push it and you're like, Ooh, did I push the right one? Cause it's gone. <laughs> it's sold. Um, so that's some, some different things. Um, and yeah, so those are the different, different options. The conference compass is more if you're doing a true conference, like, you, you know, having sessions and people in and out. And the virtual summits is the same. So does anyone have any questions? I'm sorry that this has been a little crazy. Um, I am not normally like this. <laughs> but I had this on my calendar for later in the week, but I'm still happy to, uh, to answer any questions that anybody has now. Um, and I'm also happy to hear if people want to share sort of what they've seen or any questions that they have about, you know, what, what's the path forward now that vaccines are starting and, and quite frankly, you know, the regulations about how many people can be in a room are also lifting. Well, I also am available. My email's there. So if somebody has, you know, a specific question, I'm happy to, um, you know, kind of chat through a thought with you or anything else that you may have if you um, have a specific question that we didn't talk about today. I know um, Kayla had a question about peer-to-peer -peer fundraising. Kayla, did we answer, get that answer? I can't hear answers? you, Irene. Hey, Amy, can you hear me? Looks like no. There we go. No, okay. <laughs> well, the mystery has been solved now. Amy, can... <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> 
Um, Amy, can you hear me? Okay. Um, Kayla had a question earlier about peer to peer raising uh, fundraising and Kayla, I want to make sure that you got the answer. I think we got the platforms. Yeah, both peer to peer, uh, one cause, Cutega. One cause used to be BidPal, if you're familiar with that from like way back when. Um, GiveSmart is also a great one. I've used that one in the past. Um, and those are good, you know, if you're gonna do some kind of auction or that, or that. Um, and then the Cutega, which is the other one that I mentioned, is another one. Obviously, Amy is a wealth of information, folks, so feel free to use that time. We've still got a couple of minutes left to uh, connect with her, ask your question. Trust me, it is not a stupid question. Somebody else on this call has, the, has your same question. Well, I'll ask just for information. Um, Amy, is are you seeing nonprofits benefit from really maybe expanded support now that 5Ks and golf tournaments can kind of be anywhere you want? That seems like it could almost lead to higher um, event profits. Are you seeing that? Yeah, I think too, what I'm seeing is that, you know, with the limited quantities, the events are sold out because you know, if you're at the point where you're vaccinated or you're comfortable to go out for a 5k and frankly, they're doing a pretty good job, you know, with, you know, and there's not the mass start of, um, I did one about a month ago. Um, and everybody's like spread out and then literally 10 people at a time will go. And then, you know, it's, you have the whole lane. So, you know, you're not running right behind somebody or right next to somebody. Um, and those events are sold out. I mean, there people are ready if, if they're comfortable. Some people, at least, are ready to go out and do that that type of a thing. Um, I think what we'll see. I, I, I'm having a hard time picturing the 500 person gala with the 10 top tables um, with everybody eating <laughs> happening too soon. But what I think could happen are, and this is what we're seeing a lot of these outdoor events where you're outside. There is a tent, but it's open edged. And if it's a nice day, you can go out. And, you know, if you want to wear your mask the whole time, you can. And if you, you know, if you don't, then you can go somewhere and eat and drink and, you know, that kind of thing. But people are kind of tired of missing out, I think. So um, you have to measure your audience and see. But, um, you know, and I think I'm seeing also a lot of like pre surveys, people sending out surveys saying, you know, what are you comfortable with? What will you do? Um, I have an, a client that's doing um, a conference and I also think things are going to look different. Like the, the conference is in September and we've already said, how long can we wait before we figure out if we can actually do this in person? And probably it would be a hybrid. So if you didn't want to come, we will still show it on a Zoom type thing. But if you wanted to go in person, you know, when you think about a conference, you can spread people apart. You can wear your mask. You're all facing the same way. You're not eating and drinking. It's relatively safe compared to some of it. Um, looks like there's another question for um, a friend raiser. Yep, 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 yep. So this says, has anyone held a friend raiser? This could be virtual or in person. Basically the team and the board all invite five plus friends to an open house type of event where nonprofits showcase their work, answer questions and offer a chance to get involved or give. Um, I think those are great. I mean, those to me are cultivation events. So, you know, back in the day, you might have had a donor that had, you know, was willing to open their home, kind of do the same kind of thing. But I mean, the one good thing about the Zoom is like, you don't have to commute there. Um, you know, I think we're seeing a lot of um, sort of educational events that are happening to help promote the cause and what's going on. Um, as ways to just engage your donors. And there isn't always an ask, but there's, a, you know, this opportunity to see what's going on and learn what's happening. I mean, COVID has really affected a lot of our nonprofits. And so learning about what that is and how that's happened is a great way to, you know, engage your donors and get them involved. And maybe there is an ask, maybe there's something specific around that topic that needs to be funded and there's an ask there. But yes, I think fundraisers are great. Um, I think virtual ones can be good because they're kind of easy to attend. 
Um, I think to be frank, there's some Zoom fatigue where people are kind of tired of looking at their screens, but you know, maybe it's a lunch and learn and you know, people can kind of watch without being 100% engaged, but still kind of ease to hear what's going on. There's another one, Amy, just above that, recommendations for auction items for silent auction. Okay, gotcha. Um, so again, I think that's some of, uh, of uh, so, so here's what I'm seeing around that. I'm seeing a lot of, um, you know, like one-time things. So, you know, in the past for silent auctions, I would love to do an event for 50. It sells for a ton and you might find a restaurant to donate the food and you may, you know, have a way to get a discount on the booze or whatever. I think people are shying away from those. I am seeing some sort of house party size things that you can put together. Um, and what I, what I have a client that does a lot with restaurants and what they're doing is they are asking the restaurants to participate, but they're saying, well, we'll pay your cost. So, and then that's when you know, that's where you start your bidding. So if, you know, they say you're gonna do a, a dinner for four at the restaurant and the cost is a hundred dollars and you know to start at a hundred and go up. Um, so I'm, I'm seeing that, I'm seeing items, you know, like somebody really donating something, you know, it's sporting equipment for that 5K or something of that nature. Um, yeah, so that's good. Yes, we are open in Georgia, so that makes a difference. Cause I mean, there's still places that, um, you know, really are barely open. So we are lucky to do that, but that's mostly what I'm seeing. Um, and then, you know, like service type things or other things like things you might still need that you can get donated as well. Um, those are the, the big things, but definitely like scaled down, not the big, big, things and travel you know like I love to travel travel is a great auction item but I think so people are weary and then you can't really leave but here's a good one like you may have a donor or a board member that has a cabin in North Georgia that would be awesome you know somebody can drive to it you can eat it if you want like those kind of things are still selling really well because people are definitely wanting to get away even if it's just in a different way than they might typically am I missing anybody else's questions is it, Amy, is it better to have a lot of items for a silent auction at various price points or should you sort of gravitate or kind of know your audience and gravitate towards them? I think it's good to have a variety of price points. So, you know, you may have something that's in the 25 to $50 range and then you may have a $3,000 one. I, a lot of times what I like to do is have three to five kind of live auction items and they don't have to be crazy. I mean, it could be the cabin stay in North Georgia. It doesn't have to be a trip to Paris, even in the old days. Um, and those auctions, those items will make more money um, because they're live than they would in a silent auction. So I try to have three to five of those. Some people will say they'll do one, but I am in very strong belief that it takes a little warming up of the audience. So I think ideally you do those three to five auction items live. And again, it depends on how many people are on your call. If there's 20 people, then three is way too many, but you know, maybe you do one or two. Um, and again, they vary in price point, starting low, going to the highest. And then straight from there, you would do your fund and need. So some people will want to donate by buying something. Other people don't care about that, but you don't want somebody to kind of save their money because they're hoping to get an auction item. So you do your auction items first, do your paddle ways after. And then when that happens, after that happens, I, I will keep the silent auction open another 10-ish minutes usually, because again, you don't want people to be saving their money and then they might say, oh, I didn't get that live auction item and maybe I made a small donation, but now I'll buy some of these gift certificates for the restaurants or that kind of thing. Um, but I think it's, there's, I don't have a hard and fast number, but I do think like quantity over quality. So, you know, you'll, back in the day, I would get 13 teeth whitening kits to auction off. Like nobody wants that. <laughs> so, um, and I also think you can make baskets. So maybe you get, you know, uh, a, a taste of downtown Atlanta dining packets. So you may have three $50 gift cards versus three separate $50 gift cards. What you don't want to do is take the $50 gift card from downtown Atlanta, put it with the spa that's in, you know, Alpharetta and something in the dog grooming thing from somewhere else, like make packages that make sense. Um, and I think those are good, but yeah, I think it's 20 ish 
30 ish depends on depending on how many people attend um but definitely quality over quantity and if it's something you wouldn't want to buy or someone you know wouldn't want to buy don't put it in <laughs> and also beware of the auction items that are donated that are really like not a real gift so like for example there was a time frame where people would do the photo studio sitting fee for free but then you still have to buy the photos like those don't count to me you have to at least get some photos <laughs> Uh, we are a board organization of non-golfers. What would be some good resources to learn how to hold a successful tournament? If you want to email me, amy at nextstageadv.com, I'll send you some information. There's, um, and I can't remember off the top of my head, there's a good website that's good, a good resource um, as a way to start. What I would say is um, don't go to the most expensive golf course. <laughs> Try to, you know, like we, we used one for one of our events, it's in Tucker. Um, versus going to Atlanta Country Club, you know, keep the price low and, um, you know, make it not intimidating because I think golf is one of those things where some people won't want to do because they don't feel like they're good enough. Um, although usually that's not the case. There's always <laughs> somebody who at least shares your, your skill level. Anyone else? Looks like that might be all the questions. Great. Thank you so much, Amy. I appreciate it. I have been nervous about doing any sort of fundraiser. And now that I have a map for how to do it and do it effectively, I'm excited to actually get started doing this. And I think this afternoon it'll be planning session with the other founders to figure out how we get going. So thank uh, you very much. Reach out if you have questions. I just put my email in the chat. Um, and um, yeah, I'm happy to jump on a call and, and um, you know, just if you have some ideas you want to bring to them about, I'm happy to do that. Um, but yeah, don't be afraid. People are doing it. People are making tons of money. Um, it, you know, it looks different, but um, again, I think often overall, the costs are less expensive to do it virtual. So you have a little less invested from the front side, um, which is a good thing. Thanks, everybody. Awesome. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Uh, we will have another uh, event in a couple of months, so look out for an email from us on that next event. Uh, pending anything else from Eli or Irene, thank you very much for joining. Uh, I am sure everyone is as excited as I am and now knowledgeable to get started. Thank you very much, Amy. Awesome. Thank you. Fabulous. Thank you all, and I'm looking forward to seeing you all again at the next event.